Welcome to LifeSpring Church. We hope you enjoy this message. To find out more about LifeSpring Church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifeSpring UK. So good morning. It feels like it's been a while. It's only been a week, but it feels longer than that. Um, and it was so good to see so many coming out during the week as well um, to the Reconnect meetings, which we were holding here. Um, they were great. And I hope you felt a reconnection as, as you worshipped, prayed, and uh, ministered to by the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes I feel, wouldn't it be great if that was church? Um, you know, just worshipping and loving Jesus. It would be so easy, so simple, um, his presence being so evident. But I want to put to you, if that's all it would be, it would be a deception. You see, it has its place, and it has an important place. And I love that we can show how much we love him and worship him by stopping all our other activities and from time to time just coming to love and to worship. Not asking him for anything, just giving. Because as we sang earlier on, he's worthy of it all. But the truth is, we show our love and obedience by our service. Sorry, we show our love by our obedience and our service. Our true expression of worship is following and obeying him as Lord of our lives. And out of loving obedience, true worship is expressed as we set aside time to worship and love him too. So you might be a little bit surprised at the title behind me, why, oh, it's gone again. Why, why, why sell church? But this week and next week, I just felt it was right that we remind ourselves of this important distinctive. But first of all, a short video clip. Um, thank you, James. Russ's life group, what is the importance and benefits of being in a life group? Friends, family, fun, and a fortress. Okay, I think um, the life group um, is like a sisterhood, and it's a group where people share their feelings, they share what they're passing through, they encourage as well, and you just know that you're not alone in what you're doing. There's a family, there's a support group that's there for you. That's life group for me. Yeah, I think it's having a cell group leader who always brings us sweets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think life group to me personally is um, a safe heaven. Like, I just feel very comfortable. It's like I always look forward to it. Like there's this day in the week where you just feel like, um, yeah, I can wait for Tuesday so I can go meet my sisters and say whatever I'm going through. It's just there I always look forward to. So it's really life group. Okay, um, I think life groups are important for discipleship. Um, it's good to have a leader that um, can help you through life's difficult choices. Um, like Jesus was the leader and he had all his apprentices. So yeah, it's good to have that kind of communion where you are shepherded in the right way. Um, so for me, the cell group has been, since I moved to this country so two and a half years ago and joined this as cell group, it has been a place um, of sharing a lot of tears and suffering up to today where we just share laughter and mm -hmm. we, we cry with laughter really. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's, um, you've got a family to support you on your life journey. Yeah, and for me, I love Tuesday evenings. We eat sweets most of the time. We share food together, we share life together, we love each other. We build each other up, encourage each other, we pray for each other, support each other, and I, I just love it. We couldn't do without it. So yeah, get in a life group. Okay, so that's just one of the life groups, and uh, next week we're going to hear from a couple more life groups of what it means to the people in there. Um, okay, um, I didn't give these scriptures to James, so that's my fault, but for, I just want to read a couple of scriptures. Acts 2 verse 46 tells us this every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, 
praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then a little bit later on, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Just a couple of verses from the church in the New Testament, from Acts there, um, and from where you will see that church happened just normally, regularly in homes as well as in the uh, larger buildings together. And so as I say at the beginning of, if you like, a new term, I just want to share a few more thoughts on why Cell Church and why it's such an important and possibly most challenging distinctive for us at Life Spring. But first, another heavenly principle, if you like. This comes from Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 um, reads this. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Genesis 2, chapter, uh, verse 5. An interesting verse, and it helps us understand a biblical principle Preparation and planning precede outpouring. Preparation and planning, if the outpouring is going to remain and be sustained, is important before the actual outpouring. God held back the rain because there was no one yet to manage the growth which rain would produce. So God planned and prepared and man was formed. A man's responsibility was to manage and rule the earth. He showed his love for God by fulfilling God's mandate for him. Rain poured out on shrubs and plants just produces a jungle without management. But when it's managed, it can produce a beautiful garden for the Lord. Jesus alludes to this principle. New wine, he says, needs a new wineskin. If we don't prepare a structure for new wine, Jesus tells us everything will be lost. So first the wine skin, then the new wine. It's the same with a river. A river without banks produces a flood. It's destructive. But when it's managed, when the banks are there, are there it contains and brings direction and life. And God's been speaking to us over the last few months about connecting with him. He's been inviting us to come back to the life spring, which is Jesus himself. And I want to say, church, two or three months later, if that prophetic word still applies now, we need to repent. Because that word told us we had lost connection. And if we have still lost connection, and we haven't been responding to it, we need to say sorry, because he's come to help us reconnect. He's come to, 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 to help us um, develop and strengthen that relationship with the Holy Spirit. And now it should not be a matter of I'm not connected, but it's now how do I develop that connection? How do I develop a strong connection with God so his life can flow? Because when the connection's good, rivers begin to flow. First love is renewed. And when first love's renewed, the old becomes new again. And so today I want to look at this question. Why sell church? It's part of the wineskin. It's part of the prerequisite, if you like, for unprecedented growth. It's not that the structure itself will produce that growth. Rather, rather, it's like the banks of the river. It's there to help sustain, to develop, and release the love and the life of God to those around. And when his life touches others, growth happens. When I first heard about Cell Church 20, 25 years ago, I was confused. It seemed to be all the rage. And many churches were beginning to transition to Cell Church. And I thought to myself, well, we've got cells or house groups, as we used to call them. We've always had. We started off as two house groups. What, what's it all about? What's different? Well, two things really stood out for me and helped me actually see we were not a cell church, but a church with house groups. And there's a difference. And the first thing is cells grow. Well, 
healthy cells grow. We had had our eight or ten house groups maybe for decades. And they were nice and they were friendly, but they carried no expectation of growth. Probably, and I know in some cases, not even a desire for growth. We like things as we are. It's family. It's cosy. So if a definition of a cell is a small group which grows, well, we definitely didn't have cells. We had house groups. Number one challenge. Number two challenge, cells are the backbone of the church. Cells are the strength of the church. A church with strong cells was a strong church. But a church with weak cells was actually a weak church regardless of appearances. I remember somebody coming one Sunday. They loved the atmosphere and the environment. And they went to one of our house groups and they thought they were in a different church. Everything was so different. They couldn't believe that what was being expressed on Sunday had not in any way connected with life outside of Sunday service. You see, a cell church is not a church with cells, but a church of cells. Now, that really was different. To be a member of a cell church means you have to be a member of a cell. It wasn't an optional extra. Oh, I might go to a cell group. I might join one. If you wanted to be part of a cell church, you were part of a cell. It was who we were. And more than that, a paradigm shift was needed. A cell church was as much church on Tuesday evening with seven or eight or nine of us gathering as it was on a Sunday morning. Both are important, the large and the small. It's not one or the other. And if cells are the backbone or the foundation of the church, that meant when the cells were strong, the church would be strong and not the other way around. Well, those two definitions confirmed we really weren't a cell church, but a church with cells, or house groups, as we used to call them. Now, over recent years, we've dropped the term cell, most of the time, if I remember, and used the term life group to describe our small meetings. But for some, the, the word cell, you see, it conjured up thoughts of terrorist cells or, or prison cells, but actually the term cell is illustrative of the biological cell. And did you know, actually, Christianity had cells before science discovered them. Um, in the 17th century, the, 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 the guy, the scientist who first discovered cells called them cells because they reminded him of the little groups that met in monasteries of monks which used to meet to pray in their little cells. And when he saw on his microscope all these little cells joined together, um, he called them cells because, for that reason. But I want to give you five interesting facts about the biological cell, and then I want us to relate that to cell church. So cells are the smallest units of life, I'm going to put these up a bit later, that can replicate independently. And they're referred to as the building blocks of life. Healthy cells keep dividing throughout their life. Each new cell looks identical to the original cell because the DNA branded nucleus multiplies itself before the cell reproduces. Each daughter cell contains the same DNA as the mother cell. And fifthly, the cells of a body work together as organs, muscles, bone and skin to enable the body to function well. Well, when I heard all this talk on cells, I decided to visit a few pastors in Reading to see what the difference was. They were all becoming cell churches, or at least five or six of them were. And, um, and I wanted to go and see, well, what is different? There are about five of them, as I say, and I have to admit, as I chatted and asked questions with these different pastors, most of them who are still around, it wasn't obvious to me that anything had really changed except the name. But what I did pick up is the reason for cells was to reach the lost and to disciple. And it all of a sudden struck me, with all the sort of good things that we were doing at Life Spring, actually, the two things that Jesus asked us to do, we weren't doing very well at all. 
And a cell church was meant to be able to reach the lost and disciple. I thought to myself, I need to look a little bit more into this. Two emphases, I say. Actually, not emphases or even suggestion, but two commands of Jesus. Go and make disciples. In one of my visits, I met Brother Ian Plumley, who's recovering in hospital. Um, having done an amazing catch, I'm told, last week. Catching this little four-year-old out, but in so doing, unfortunately, dislocated his hip. And he's been in hospital ever since, coming out tomorrow. Is that right, Heather? So we need to pray for Ian. But Ian was pastor in Gateway Church in Reading at the time, and, and in his office he had a magazine about cells. And I read an article there about a church in Scotland who'd never won souls before, a bit like I felt we were, but that year they'd seen 60 people saved. And actually the church had doubled in size. I was gripped with their story. I invited the pastor to come to Reading, and to cut a long story short, six months later, Jackie and I were together with Pastor Jimmy in Bogota, Colombia. We were visiting a church of 250,000, divided into 40 or 50,000 cell groups across the city. Wow. And what struck Jackie and I more than anything else was their love and passion. Their love and passion for Jesus, their love and care for each other, and their love and care for the lost. Love stood out as the foundation block of what this church was about. Every week, hundreds, if not thousands, were getting saved. And as impressive was, a year on, 70% of those were still in the church and actively involved. Do you know, after Billy Graham or Reinhard Bonker or any of the other evangelists have done their crusades, usually it's 5% which remain. This church was seeing 70% still involved. Do you know how they did that? Through cells. Cells were involved in every aspect of life. They were involved in their evangelism and winning. They were involved in their consolidating and discipling and their caring. And let me emphasize here, the structure didn't cause the growth. The structure simply sustained and developed growth, which came from the Holy Spirit. That's why we can't ignore connection. If we ignore connection, we end up with a rigid legalistic structure which actually maybe kills life rather than releases life but when the life of the Holy Spirit is pulsating through the people of God then, then the wineskin remains supple no Holy Spirit no connection no river no life no Holy Spirit no heart no vision but with him great wine skin wow with him new wine new wine skin we need to get ready for harvest so Jackie and I came back convinced we need to learn from this church if we too are going to be able to win souls and disciple them well and make a difference for Jesus in Reading so we began a transition to cell church it's not been easy I'm not sure we've even arrived yet it's radical it's so different and to understand cell church requires that paradigm shift. But I want us to look again quickly at those five characteristics which I mentioned of the biological cells. Number one, cells are the smallest units of life that can replicate independently. Small groups of men and women with a leader and a vision to grow, we believed with the right support and encouragement could multiply into new cells. They were church. Where two or three gathered, Jesus was in their midst. Cells meeting every week, every cell teaching the Bible. We didn't always do that in our house groups, but teaching the Bible, applying the teaching, and praying for each other. And we were encouraged to invite our friends and to make him known. Every cell had the same leader, had a leader with the same vision to care, to win souls, to make disciples. And that leader was also in another cell where they too could be cared for. Cells were church in the home, just like New Testament. So first of all, 
They're the small units of life that can replicate independently. And when his life is pulsating through, we should be expecting those cells to multiply and grow. Number two, healthy cells keep dividing throughout their life. So the challenge is to keep healthy cells because it's only healthy cells which grow or which we want to grow. We don't want cancerous cells. We want healthy cells to grow. So a challenge for all our cells is growth, new growth. Because according to the definition, according to biology, healthy cells grow. And if they're not growing, it indicates something needs to change. And we're not just talking about drawing in people from other cells or other churches. No, of course not. We're talking about new growth, new souls, new disciples. This, this, this point continues to be one of our biggest challenges. But I'm so pleased it's there because we can't settle. We need to be a cell church, a church which grows. So we need to reconnect, catch the heart of Jesus for those not yet saved. I want to show you a quick second video um, of a baptism which just happened a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if Maxine is here. If you are, just wave somewhere. Oh, she is. Hello, Maxine. We went to show it last week. Um, can we just show the video, please, James? Thank you. For most of my life, I feel that I have been pulled between your light and the darkness. I was weak and vulnerable. I allowed myself to be overtaken by darkness, but yet you never left my side, trying to give me warnings and showing that you love me no matter my wrongs. <clears throat> I now see and know that you have put certain obstacles in my path to build me to be at my strongest and lead me to your righteous path, to welcome me home and to be with my brothers and sisters who are here with me today, who want what is best for me as you do. I ask that you continue to make me strong and bring my daughter home to me, Lord God. So I give my life and my soul to you and ask that you wash away my wrongs in this river and cleanse my soul, Lord, and bless me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So I'll just rip the words, but I truly believe this is from God. Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise for Maxine's decision to be baptized today. Father, she has asked and you have answered. She has seeked and she has found you. She has knocked and you have opened the door of salvation and eternal life. We call upon you, most gracious Holy Spirit, to fill Maxine from the inside out with your presence, to guide her in all that she does forevermore. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So, have you made a decision to turn your life towards Jesus and to live for him only? Yes. Based on your profession of faith, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we just want to praise you, we want to thank you for nothing, and I pray, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, pour out yourself in abundance on this day's life, Lord, comfort us. To guide her and all that she does from this moment forth in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. What's that got to do with Cell Church? That's what it's all about. It's what it's all about. Do you know what? Maxine's cell leader wasn't even a Christian three years ago. Sam became a Christian. Sam attended Cell. Sam went on life class. Sam attended destiny training. Sam, three or four months ago, asked if she could open a cell. She didn't have anybody. And there were three or four young women who she'd not met before, turned up here one Sunday morning. She plucked up courage, said, do you want to come to my house? We'll have pizza, we'll have a cell together. And, and, and from there, Maxine, I don't know if you were one of those original ones, but, uh, but, but Maxine came into this group. And Maxine gave her life to the Lord in one of these cell meetings just a few weeks back. And Maxine knew that the next step was to get baptised. And so rather than wait for getting everything sorted out up here, we did it a bit more like the New Testament did. And we just found some water. It was a bit of a long walk for poor old Chris. It was about half a mile. But, uh, but we found some water. 
and we baptized Maxine. And I'm thinking, that is such a brilliant example of what cell life is about. And now I hope Maxine, you're going to invite some friends, and I hope Maxine will herself eventually want to open her own cell too, so that she will be able to, as she's trained and equipped and finding more in the Lord, she will be able to impart new life to those which she invites. Cells are meant to grow and keep growing and dividing, multiplying actually. Right, time's running out. Let me quickly move on. Number three, each new cell looks identical to the original cell because of the DNA-branded nucleus. This was a challenge, but if the DNA of the church was to be replicated, it needed to be received and imparted. That's what Jesus did. He spent time with his 12, imparting his heart and his vision. And when he left, one of the, one of the accounts says, they realized, unlearned as they were, but they're just like Jesus. They'd spent time with Jesus. They had received his DNA. They had received his heart and his vision. Every cell was to have the same aims and structure. Though obviously it would be expressed differently with different personalities. Every cell was to have a leader who carried the same heart and the same vision as their leaders. Then in theory, as they reproduced, then that same heart and vision gets reproduced and little cells spring up all across Reading. Hallelujah with a heart to love Jesus, to love people, to win souls, and to make disciples. Number four, each daughter cell contains the same DNA as the mother cell. The goal of every leader was to multiply their cell by raising up leaders to lead their own cells, carrying the same DNA as their cell leader. This concept, so foreign to many of us in the West, we think independence and, and free thinking, you know, it's, it's what we fought the wars for. I'll tell you, if you look at scripture time and time again in Old Testament and in New Testament, we read, follow the pattern, set an example, imitate me, teach what I teach. You see, cells, they're not a separate church, they're part of the whole. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, Paul says, and the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. So he's talking to Timothy. The things you heard me say to you, you teach to men who can teach to others. Do you see the four generations there? It's not like Timothy thinking up his own, his own style of church and what have you, and I'm going to do things my way. No, Timothy wanted to follow Paul, and he wanted to teach that to his disciples who would teach it to their disciples too. What a challenge for us. Of course, as I say, different personalities, different ways of expressing. Same heart, same vision, all the way through. But where that connection is broken, where, 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 where another vision has come, or where offense has taken root, where that connection with leadership has been broken, independence has developed, then a different heart so easily begins to be imparted rather than the original pure heart. So number five. The cells of a body work together as organs, muscles, bones, skin to enable the body to function well. This doesn't carry over quite in the same way as that what I've just been describing, but it does remind us we've all got a part to play. We've all got a different um, contribution to make. Every member is important. And as cells work together, and as cells join together as part of the whole, part of the larger church, then we come together with the different gifts, the different abilities which God has given us with the same heart, the same vision to win souls, to make disciples and to glorify him. We use the gifts, we use the ministries. You know, so, some people, it's so different to others. But when we've received his heart and love, then we express it in that way with different gifts and anointings. And as a cell church, we function together. Different cells, different members, working together to glorify Jesus. And within the cell too, different personalities, different gifts, different emphases, but one heart. So I just wanted to remind you today, um, Matthews, if we could begin to come up, please. I want to remind you today of this important distinctive of cell church. Do you know what? Sometimes it would be easier to forget cell. Let's just worship here every night of the week. Let's just come and receive him and, and tell him we love him and... Um, tell you we will have missed the boat because our worship is expressed by following and obeying 
And as we obey and catch his heart for the lost, then we become obedient worshippers of Jesus. It's a model of cell church which helps us fulfill the Great Commission. It's a model which helps us pastor and disciple everyone in the church. We could have meetings 10 times over the weekend, full up here every meeting. What would that be? 6,000 people or something like that. And do you know because of cells, everyone could have their own pastor. Everyone could be discipled and cared for. It's a model of church with potential for exponential growth. As we connect to our life spring and we remain connected to each other. So let's pray we'll be effective and fruitful across Reading as we seek to be obedient to this heavenly vision God's given us. Amen. Amen. So a couple of questions there for life groups, but uh, Matthews, you've probably got a different plan, but I was wondering whether we could go back to one of the songs we've already sung. Is that all right? Because as I was uh, thinking about Hearing Matthew say earlier on, you were worthy of it all. I thought, Matthews, I want to sing that again in the context of our service, our life. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of every cell group that we're raising up, every cell group that we attend, every opportunity we take to share the gospel of Jesus, every act of kindness we show to the refugees, every young child which is receiving uh, that downstairs at this moment in time is because he's worthy of it all he's worthy of it all he's worthy of a house which brings him glory and we're doing it all for the glory of jesus thanks for watching this message we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did to find out more about our church head to linktr.ee forward slash lifespring uk